Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are here at theCUBE live UI Path Forward 2024. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got two CUBE alum for us this, this session. Kevin Crone, he's partner, PwC Consulting Technology and Transformation, Hyper Automation Leader at PwC. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. And Amit Kumar, VP Industry Practice at UiPath. Thank you so much, both Thank of you. Thanks for having us. So today we're talking about some research that PwC conducted, uh, resulted in, in a really interesting article. It's it's clear we know that the banks are going to continue to make investments in hyper automation, um, but in the longer term, Gen AI is really going to have a, a huge and transformative effect on banks and changing the way that work gets done and, and introducing all sorts of new capabilities. Kevin, I want to start with you. What what prompted this research now? What were you seeing that that, that made you say we need, we need to dive into this? Sure. Um, so. Banks were one of the first major um, investors or buy-ins on robotic process automation technology dating back to 2016, 2017. Uh, time frame and probably you know we felt had the, the biggest kind of tranche of lessons learned from what worked and didn't work and so our our hypothesis actually which was was disproven in the research was uh, that we actually were going to see a decrease in kind of some of the early generation automation investments, some kind of the pure play RPA investments that were happening. Um, and as Gen AI was becoming a much bigger piece of the, the transformation picture, you know, our, our hypothesis was let's take all the, there's a lot of lessons learned from the, the investments, the good, bad, and ugly, in terms of what's been done. Let's take those lessons and really try to inform how banks think about the next generation of automation investment. Um, so that was our hypothesis. Um, you know, what, uh, what, uh, what I'll say, what we found from the survey were two major themes that came out of it. One theme was around the fact that investments in what we're calling hyper automation, the collection of automation technologies, including RPA, are actually increasing, not decreasing. Um, and, uh, and, and it's as relevant, if not more relevant, than it was in 2016. Um, the second piece was as, as banks are forming their generative AI investments, there is definitely a lack of connection between their generative AI strategies and their hyper automation strategies, and there's a huge opportunity to better converge this. And I think as we think about the theme that we've heard throughout this conference on agentic automation, there's there's a big opportunity to think about how hyper automation really drives um, action and and drives value for generative AI investments. So the death of RPA, Amit, was greatly exaggerated, <laughs> as the city goes. Um, and you guys are making the case that it's, it, RPA is essentially, maybe even a prerequisite for a successful uh, agentic automation, or certainly uh, an accelerant toward it. I, thoughts? No, I completely agree, and I think I, my, I personally call it like a stepping stone. And this is a journey that we have lived with most of the banks, you know, who have been part of the survey, which is they first started with RPA, they scaled it to all the business units, to all their core processes. Then they started deploying intelligent document processing to take care of the unstructured data. So that expanded the business value that uh, Kevin spoke about. And now they are beginning to use new Gen AI experiences like Autopilot. And that bodes well for that agentic future that we are trying to paint for financial services industry. So I, to your point, Ed, I think that's how we look at it as well. It's interesting, Kevin, because you, you went into the, the study with that thesis, which was disproven. And I think a lot of people felt like, well, you know, put the brakes on RPA and Gen AI will take care of everything. And but why do you think that hasn't happened, is it because people just realize it's a lot harder than just talking to an LLM? I think it's, there's probably two different things. Um, there is still a lot of legacy process that, that has been built up amongst um, our, our banking clients and, and you're looking at you know, decades of, uh, of business processes that um, still need to be tackled from an overall uh, understanding and optimization perspective. And I you know, kind of said, you know, more simply like work was not done, you know, was not completed in those early phases of RPA. And so I think there's still tons of opportunity to really drive more simple automation cases. At the same point, I think as we look at what, you know, a lot of the use cases that are coming out from a generative AI perspective, you know, there's, you know, banks, uh, um, technology architecture, their, their stack and how, um, how action actually gets done is not the top 
thing that's coming out of it. A lot of it's really about how do you drive, you know, insight, how do you drive uh, better uh, analytics, but then you really have to think about this, this concept of action. And I think as we you know, start to make the connection, um, and this, this may be through how hyper automation extends the power of the Gen AI toolkit, or it could be on how Gen AI accelerates implementation of hyper automation, there's a ton of opportunities to move quicker and implement more powerful use cases. So I mean, I, I, I thought Bobby Patrick coined the term hyper automation, but it turns out it was Gardner. <laughs> and uh, Bobby just picked up on it. But, but so help people understand what that is, because I think when Gardner put that term out, Absolutely. a lot of people kind of ran away from RPA. Oh, mm -hmm. that's legacy, we're not legacy, we're hyper automation. Well, how should we think about the difference between the two generally and then specifically within banking? I, I, I like to take an example to illustrate that. And uh, you know, if you look at every customer journey in a large bank, it comprises of a lot of deterministic steps and also a lot of the steps where judgment and reasoning is involved. So take a look at commercial banking client onboarding. Essentially that would mean that somebody in bank would take the documents from the client, will run the checks on those documents, extract the details, and then go ahead and do the KYC, anti-money laundering, look at some exceptions, look at those alerts, figure out this is a legitimate entity or not, before they go ahead and onboard the client. Now, if you really look at the journey, there are pieces where RP works perfectly, where you would need to integrate with legacy systems, you would like to call third-party services, RPA is the answer. And then you need to look at the other you know, weapons in the Cueva, you'll have to go to intelligent document processing to handle client documents. You will have to bring in autopilot to get the client over onboarding team to work on exceptions and do ad hoc queries. So I think, I think that's the scope, that is the spectrum that in real world exists and hyper automation through its multiple technologies need to address it end to end. Yeah, the, the one piece I'll just add on quickly, we, we saw this in the, uh, in the data, um, the, the investment strategy uh, in banks largely had different kind of centers of excellence or different groups kind of un manning different aspects of the technology. So you would have an RPA COE, you would have a BPM workflow COE, you would have a document processing COE. And one of the, the lessons learned is like investments going in here, but we need to actually rationalize and bring that all together as a single offering, right? Because to the extent you're successful in doing it, the, there's a bigger opportunity to then have the discussion on how does this intersect with your overall generative AI strategy, because you're talking around how to in, how an entire ecosystem of tools you're managing intersect into that. I also think it's helped out with the problem of picking on a single technology like RPA and saying, well, this thing can't do everything. Well, no, it wasn't designed to do everything. It was designed to solve certain problems, as if uh, as is all these other capabilities are designed to solve problems, and the power is really the collection of all, the, all those capabilities together. So Kevin, you're seeing those COEs come together, e e even yeah. though, I mean, banks can have a tendency to be pretty stovepipe, but the, the COEs were cross-functional, is that right, previously, or were they oftentimes embedded inside of certain we, components of the bank? Or we, we, of the we bank? saw two different things coming out. I think one was, as part of the convergence of the technology capabilities together, one of the, I think, one of the themes we heard universally from the kind of center uh, groups, like a center of excellence, was this is actually a combination of a technology play and an overall process optimization, productivity play. Like how do we actually think about taking, looking at this more from a business functional lens than a technology lens and really how you converge that all and the capability really should think about that, which lends itself well to thinking about this hyper automation concept and the collection of technologies versus everything else. I think the other thing that we saw, and I think it's also been a shift, um, a lot of the decisions on how things get implemented are shift, you know, shifting into more federated parts of, of banks. And a lot of this becomes, how do you take the capabilities that a center of excellence incubates and apply it in a major transformation effort? So as you think about how you're transforming your compliance function, your client onboarding function, right. your your finance and accounting function, how, where, how do those things intersect? And, and um, in a lot of cases, it's the teams that own those initiatives who are really responsible for executing with support from the center of excellence. That's a that's a maturity, right? Because if I if I rewind the clock back five years ago, 
there was kind of a feeling like we're just going to build this single group and the single group does everything and that's that's definitely not the case and definitely not what the data showed. Right. So one of the recommendations from the report, it, I'm, I'm quoting now, as a no regret move, we recommend investment in the citizen activator persona. Yes. And we, we've talked about citizen development before here on theCUBE with you, actually. You say organizations should identify the right mix of digital and human skills to drive innovation and establish more formal upskilling programs. To what extent are banks embracing this now or are you sort of saying, guys, <laughs> don't regret this? Well, the one of the questions that we asked in in all the interviews that we did was around how is citizen development emerging and citizen development is actually a still fairly controversial topic amongst banks because you're talking about giving business users the power to do development that traditionally has resided with an IT function and you get into sort of this IT versus business um, sort of debate and there's all sorts of risk and governance considerations. What we found from the research is it's it's it, it's become a thing in banks, and it's it's emerging as a capability. But it's it's a niche capability. There are specialists in business functions, particularly in more data intensive functions like finance and risk, of people that are used to working in 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 in, in spreadsheets and Python and others that really have an aptitude for picking up and becoming that system developer profile. That's fine, and that that will continue to be a thing. I think as we've talked about in the past. But what we heard consistently across the board was that that may only cover 10 or 20% of the organization. We're thinking about the other 80% and how do you actually start to tackle that? And the big demand that most of the um, automation executives that we interviewed saw was, how do I engage business users more cohesively? How do, how do I educate them on all the technology options that are available? How do they play a bigger role in developing those solutions? How do they be, play a bigger role from an innovation perspective? And really as generative AI enters the picture, how do they understand where AI is useful, where basic automation technology is useful, where other solutions may be useful? And so a lot of this turned to we're trying to figure out what that looks like. And so the citizen activator term uh, was, was a term we coined because it's, it's to us it was different than a citizen developer is really thinking about what is the, the, the digital aware business user of the future and how do you actually set up the right programmatic efforts to, to cultivate that. And semantically less scary for banks who are concerned about all the issues you just talked about. Exactly, and it's also, I mean, it goes a little bit at, you know, as, 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 as generative AI just picture and people start worrying about the future of work and what their roles look like, this is a little bit of a counterbalance to that because if people can actually be part of that transformation process, they can help define what those roles and jobs in the future look like. I like, we just had uh, Ed and Tokion um, going through the stack, yeah. and there's a finding in here, the Hyper Automation Toolkit is a collection of technologies, not just RPA, and it, it basically lays out the capabilities that are needed. Low code is one, I want to come back to that. Intelligent document processing, productivity and process measurement tools, you got to measure it, to see if the effective data workflow tools, critical that the agents have access to that. Uh, consistent integration layers for existing application stack. I think this is really crucial, because you get all this business logic and data and metadata locked inside of apps, so you got to be able to integrate to that. Uh, and then, obviously, intelligent agents and conversational interfaces, everybody can kind of relate to that, and then AI injected into all of these capabilities throughout the stack. So I, I thought that was a pretty good mapping to the stack that we just talked about yeah. with Ed and, and Toki. The low code piece is interesting. It's, it's, it's intriguing to hear, Kevin, you talk about that maybe there's a little bit of blowback. I know when you talk to developers, like citizen developers, they're like, don't even use that term, right? <laughs> but to really um, to harness the knowledge with those frontline workers, you have to give them tooling to be able to at least affect some kind of automations, don't you? Uh, and I, I'll give a, a very quick example. You had Ed here, who's obviously you know father of our communications process, communications mining platform. Right. And that's a good example where most of the large banks have a messy inbox problem. These are the business teams who continue to get complaints and escalations and requests from the clients. What we're finding is that if you give them a highly intuitive user interface like communications mining, these are the business users who are going to build these models. They are the ones who are going to test their hypothesis in terms of which is the best route for these emails to go and then productionize and deploy them with the help of technology teams. I think that's a citizen activator role. You know, from our perspective, our endeavor is to how do we make it as 
intuitive and visit driven and user guided as much as possible for these operations teams. Thanks. So what is next? What's in store for hyper automation? And I'm also interested to hear whether or not the trends that you're seeing in banking, especially in light of their Gen AI investment agenda, if you're seeing them in other kinds of companies yeah. and, and industries. I, I know you mentioned that they were early adopters of RPA for, for all the reasons you, you discussed, but what are you seeing in terms of banks and are they leading the way? So, yeah, we, we chose banking because we thought they were one of the early adopters and probably had the most amount of data and experiences to, to give a well-rounded view. And other industries, you know, are a little bit laggards to this. And, and so this would hopefully somewhat predict how we're seeing this in the future. I think the interesting part is uh, from a, from a hyper automation perspective, I think that's true. I think if we flip to the generative AI agenda, one of the uh, pieces of feedback we got pretty consistently through the interviews were that uh, most banks are moving pretty cautiously with their generative AI strategies, you know, as they work through concerns on risk and governance, and they're 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 all in on the technology, but they're they're you know they're obviously doing it in a methodical way. So I think one of the things we might see as as other industries evolve, there's going to be a, a bit of a convergence because you may see other industries that are moving a little bit quicker on the advanced end of this, and and. Um, you know, and part of our recommendation coming out of the paper was really thinking about how do you actually better converge a lot of those ecosystems. Going back to your uh, your center of excellence questions, um, the generative AI kind of organizational structure in, in most organizations is still very central. It, it kind of looks like what RPA looked like in 2016. Yeah. There's reasons why a lot of that may actually stay central so you can get better leverage out of the investments and a lot more repeatability out of solutions that are being built. But as as you try to figure out how that actually intersects with hyper automation. I think there's a big open question around, okay, how how do you take a lot of those federated efforts that are now happening and actually converge it into what's happening in the center of AI? So, well, Kevin, Amit, thank you both so much for coming on the show. A really great conversation. Good to have you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. We're going to take a quick break, but I hope you'll return for more of theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.